I'm sorry I couldn't come yesterday because of some emergency at home. So it was to do my last lecture. But what I'd like to have, what I'm going to have the yesterday's lecture today and today's lecture will be our last lecture. It's a mutually convenient. So why they keep looking at that? So now I'm going to today. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about black holes across the mass spectrum. So that's because black holes can have many different kinds of masses. <clears throat> so you've got many black holes, which I'm not going to talk about. And then you've got stellar mass black holes, which you already have another picture I'm talking about. Then there's a supermassive black holes. Oh my God. And there are these supermassive black holes, which have a 1 million solar mass to 10 to the 13 solar masses, 10 to 14 solar masses. And then the intermediate mass black holes, which mean uh, a, 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 about 100 solar masses, about a million solar masses. So the question is, uh, the point is that these are all, they arise in a completely different processes. And they also lead to different manifestations. So you would have probably learned about these things through your lectures, but in a scattered fashion, so I'm going to put it all together. So the, about 50% of my talk is a completely qualitative or more. And then uh, some of it is quite quantitative. And nearly everything that I say uh, actually has got very strong theoretical background. And there are theorems or there are uh, derivations which establish everything very quantitative. Okay, but I would really won't have time to go through that. But there's some part which I like very much and it's extremely important to do day-to-day -day calculations and for you to be able to feel that you have learned something that I'm going to do quite quickly. Okay, so it's just two lectures. Okay. And so uh, the list of topics, introduction to black holes, and then theory of black holes, telomar black holes, supermassive black holes. I already mentioned this, information of black holes. I will not be able to cover everything, but let's see how far we can So, <clears throat> now, our introduction to black hole mass, we need what are the different kinds of black holes. So, you've got the primordial black holes, which are talked about by Stephen Hawking, where he combined the relativity with quantum field theory. And he showed that the objects, the black, the, all black holes, they radiate. Meaning, what happens is when you get a particle antiparticle pair, uh, which, which comes out of the vacuum, uh, <coughs> conserving energy, momentum, everything. And one of those will escape infinity, and another will fall into the black hole. Uh, and the result of it, uh, it's a not, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's not a particle antiparticle pair, it's a positive mass negative, positive energy negative energy pair. And the negative energy particle falls inside. Uh, as a result of which, the mass decreases. Okay, and then you appear, it appears as if there's a radiation of particles coming out of particles, energetic particles and radiation coming out of So, uh, but the process is very slow and it becomes meaningful only for the black holes with very, very tiny parts. And it's not clear how those are going to work. And so this is a, this is a very well proven theoretical concept, but it has no physical counterpart of it. Okay, so then you have got the stellar mass black holes, which arise in the normal evolution of stars, which you already talked about, one to hundred solar masses. Okay, then intermediate mass black holes, and uh, black holes in this category have been found by LIGO, not towards the 10 to the 5, but towards the 100 
sur le Mars. Ok, then the supermassive black holes. And uh, the best candidate for it, of course, is the, is the object at the center of a galaxy. Uh, but we believe that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy, whether the galaxy is active or whether it is not active. And our galaxy is not active. Okay, but yeah, there is a very well established, extremely compact object at the center. And we know its mass pretty accurately. It shows all kinds of general relativistic effects. Uh, but and it is widely believed to be an actual supermassive black hole. Okay, now uh, when you um, when you talk about a black hole, uh, it's very really pristine. Okay, so Chandrasekhar started working on general relativity very late in life, and then uh, he liked black holes because of the very pristine nature, and because he could handle them mathematically. And then he wrote a book on the theory of black holes. Okay, so uh, the only observed properties a black hole can have are its mass, okay, and its spin, um, and any electric charge that it has. Right, so how do we know that it can? Because there's a there's a theorem called the no-hair theorem, which tells you that any other property, and what other properties can a black hole have, for example? Uh, it could have a dipole moment or quadrupole moment. What does that mean? It that we always look at it as a spherical object. When it's spinning, it will not be completely spherical. But there could be other more complications in the structure. Okay, but um, when the black hole is actually formed, these complications are all radiated. And what you are finally left is just a mass per space and electric charge. Now, even though this is theoretically possible, in practice, you know that matter in the universe is neutral. And on the small scale, you can separate out protons and electrons. You can have a plasma, charge plasma. But then, in the large scale, uh, it's electrically neutral. So therefore, it would be difficult to actually form a black hole with a positive or a negative charge. And so that's a theoretical, well-studied theoretical concept, but again, unlikely to have, we are very unlikely to come across charged black holes. So therefore, we are left with only two properties, mass and spin. Okay, and then, uh, because, because they're so simple, there are only these two properties and nothing else, it also means that the properties of black holes are scale free so it doesn't matter uh, um, how much the mass is. This whole mass spectrum that you have got, so if you've got a black hole like that, then it can affect the space-time curvature in the same way, and then you can detect it in the same way. And so, so the, uh, it doesn't matter how much the mass of the black hole or how much the speed. There's an upper limit on this. And so, uh, I mean, if you try to picture a lone black hole, this is what you'll see, except for the possibility that a lone black hole actually acts as a gravitational lens. So I have come to that towards the end of my lecture, if that happens. And that phenomenon will already be observed. Okay, but otherwise you won't see anything. In order to see it, it has to be the proximity of other object. Right? Uh, with which, whose matter it can take in. Right? So you see that here, uh, I mean, we have, we have seen this many times now, but there is X-ray binary. So there is a there's a black hole here, there's a star there, and then a companion coming in and going across it and with that machine disk. And so then, uh, you, you can't really say whether it's a neutron star or a black hole, but I already mentioned that it depends on the mass. If the mass is higher than about three solar masses, then it is, it has to be a black hole. Right, just because, just like the Chandrasekhar limit, there's a limit on the mass of neutron stars, open and in front of it. Okay, so uh, there's one thing, the other one is that you can have a black hole, a uh, supermassive black hole in the galaxy. So there again, uh, the, the the things surrounding the black hole can get very complicated. And then you can have, you you also get an accretion disk there, and the black hole can keep eating up stars, and uh, which can power the black hole. And you need about one, you need a black hole to suck in about one, one star per year uh, to keep it going at about 10 to the 45 volts per second. And yet you get all kinds of phenomena associated. Right? So these are the supermassive black holes. Now, um, so if you if you actually work, I should have put it in a couple of diagrams more, but if you, if you work on the geometry of the black hole, and then it turns out to be quite um, quite interesting. Because you've got the Schwarzschild geometry to which we'll come to. Okay, so uh, then you've got the event horizon. Right, so now, when you when you look at the geometry, you see that there's a particular problem. 
So I cannot go into the details. This is one of the federal diagram. And there's something called, you see that there's a singularity at R which you must have already heard about. People have told you about that, right? And R is equal to 2 GM by C squared, which is a structural weakness. So because um, some one metric tensor component becomes zero, the other becomes zero. So you feel that there's a similarity, but we can only call it event horizon. So nothing can escape from inside event horizon to the outside of the event horizon. So when you uh, when you actually consider the mathematical representation of a black hole in, in a coordinate system uh, in which R is equal to 12 is nothing special. Okay, it's an event horizon, but there should be no similarity. But then you get the upper part of the black And then this particular representation of the geometry of a black hole. So the blue line here is actually a singularity. Okay, and that singularity is at infinity. So what has happened is that we call a conformal transformation. Meaning that uh, you take uh, you take something at infinity and then you are changing the scale by dividing it by other scale. And then that brings infinity to a finite size. So this is the singularity in the black hole. This is the event horizon. There's nothing special about it, except that you see that only inward going trajectories. There's nothing which is coming out of the event horizon. It's only half the black hole. But it's only the half. When you look at uh, the Schwarzschild coordinates, and put them in the proper coordinate system, you get only the upper half. So then the idea is, why should we consider only the upper half? Okay, because then you have the divided line, and outside there, there is nothing. So what you do is that you reflect the diagram. Okay, and then this is a complete solution. Okay, meaning that if you are only the upper part, then lines like this don't end. Okay, this corresponds to motions of particles and photons. Okay, so anything which is on 45 degrees will try to the point. And you see that it will say end. So you said, why should it end at the finite point? It doesn't be reflected. So this is the entire uh, <coughs> short side solution. The upper part of the black hole and the lower part of the white hole. Okay, and, uh, and then you can have a throat between the two, the black hole and the white hole. So it's all these amazing property, science fiction like property, you know, they come out of our understanding of the control diagram and of the corresponding metrics and so forth. Unfortunately, I can't go into that. This is just to get your curiosity and you may want to read that for you. There's a very beautiful book by Hartle. And uh, Jim, uh, James Hartley. And it used to be available in a uh, paperback. It was quite inexpensive, 700 rupees or so. And James Hartley was a great relativist. And uh, and then he, uh, so what he did was that he wrote this book, where the first part of the book, first two thirds of the book, does not require general details. It only introduces the concept of space time. It does all these things. And then the, then the Einstein equations come. Now, it is two thirds, the last one third of the book. And then things are developed form. So it's, it's an extremely good book, and it has, brought, it has been brought out in a very expensive edition by Cambridge University Press. And I'm just <coughs> reading it for the last two days uh, for this lecture. And it has happened to me on at least three occasions that when I was reading a book by an author, he died. But James Hartwell died. I don't know when he died, but he was just within the last couple of days or a week or so. It was quite, quite senior. It was not. Uh, unexpected or anything like that. And so then, Agit Pedros uh, got the Nobel Prize for his work on black holes, as you know. Much of that work was done by Stephen Hawking, but Stephen Hawking did, so he didn't get that thing. And then uh, they gave the theorems uh, which established things like similarities, either black hole similarity or a similarity at the beginning of the universe. Uh, they said that these are true, they are not because of. Any artifacts like the assumed homogeneous and isotropy and so forth. So they are called the singularity theorems. And some of you may know, or at least you should know, uh, that an extremely important component in the construction of the singularity theorem is what is known as Reichel's ring equation. Right? Aka Reichel's ring of President Sikorsky, then of President Sikorsky. And in fact, uh, in this August, it is going to be his birthday. And he was very important for us in the making of Ayuka. So he is a, was a great relativist, and there other one called PC Vaidya, who gave the Vaidya metric, and they were our mentors when we created this. Okay, so, uh, 
Now the theory of black holes, and uh, they know this is why we should only go to general relativity black holes. You can also have, as you already know, um, within Newtonian theory, there are things called black holes. Okay, because you have got the Newtonian equation there, which you are very familiar with. Uh, and then uh, you are also familiar with the concept of escape velocity. So sit at the top, then for a ball up, it goes up and comes down. The faster it is, the further it goes. And eventually, <coughs> so you can say that it is, it is starting off with zero velocity or finite velocity or whatever. Have a half m square, no, sorry, it's finite velocity, but total energy is zero. So half m square by the GMM by R and right? so, <coughs> so then V is equal to root GM by R. Okay, when you do this, the, the thing goes off to infinity. When at infinity it lands zero velocity. When in the right hand side is a finite quantity, positive quantity, and then it will uh, it, it will be a it will finite velocity. If it is negative, then it can't escape, it will always come back. And so this marginal velocity, below this it will always come back, above this it escapes. It will escape velocity 11.2 kilometers per second. So you can write this. So if I go on, if I have a fixed radius and increase the mass, okay, then we will keep increasing it eventually with C. Or if I hold M constant and keep decreasing the radius, I will be that. And uh, then soon I'll reach a radius which is equal to 2 gm by c squared. And uh, at that point, light cannot escape from this point. Right? So I will show you my put at this before. So, so the point is that uh, nobody got shocked by this result. Okay, because because they simply because uh, if light can't escape, it doesn't matter, something else which moves faster than this. Or if somebody is running and then shines a torch, then the, you add the velocity of light to the velocity of the person, and then that will escape. So nobody will bother about it. Okay, but at this one, of course, uh, quite early, the first person to was John Michel. And then he said that you have a body with the same density as the sun, but 500 times larger, will not allow light to escape. Okay, and then the more famous person, Laplace, of whom you have all heard. Uh, so it, it said that the greatest luminous bodies are on this very account of this. Okay, but nobody was uh, telling me, uh, and so now black holes in general relativity is a completely different ball game. And so there, now just to see why uh, the, why it gets so upsetting in general relativity. Look at uh, special relativity. And are you familiar with the concept of a light cone? No. So I've got an event horizon, I got an event here, and everything that the event can affect. Okay, is known as future code. Everything that can affect the uh, event, okay, will be the past life. And so, if I, for example, decide to throw down the laptop and break it, so one of you may um, see that's what I'm going to do. You come running and stop me from The question is, how far can you come from? Okay, so there's a distance that will be able, from which you'll be able to reach me traveling with the speed of light. Okay, so. Uh, so then you will have to come running along the edge of the light cone like this. Okay, but if you're further, then you can't reach it. And so anything which is in the fast light cone can affect my decision to throw the laptop on the ground. Okay, and then whatever that decision I make can reverberate in the space. And this is the, these are the space like events which cannot be connected to this event by uh, lines, by anything which is traveling at speed. And less than the speed of light. Okay, you exceed the speed of light. So space time breaks down into the future and the past. Right? And then the metric for the space time. Okay, is given by the uh, by the simple uh, specific metric of special relativity. Okay, so here uh, you see that ds squared is an invariant. And in fact, these transformations are those which will need this one invariant. Now, if I go from x, y, z coordinates, I can have r, theta, phi, t coordinates. Then, you see that here, the coefficients are minus 1, 1, 1, 1. But here, the coefficients, minus 1, 1, but here, the last one. And for, uh, so, clearly, the surfaces of r is equal to constant are going to be spheres. But the whole flat space-time geometry is mapped in terms of these spheres. Right? So, so you take this sphere with a certain radius,
areas and a point is located on that square. So you do theta phi and r. Right? And then, of course, you have block taking. So you get p. Right? So uh, now, when you go to general relativity, so the important thing is that there are no privileged frames of difference. Because in the previous state, in, the space, in flat space time, you can work with cocky uh, frames of reference, you can work with accelerated frames of reference. But nevertheless, to make the assertion uh, that space time is flat and which requires the existence of this inertial frame. Okay, it's a very special thing. So, in general relativity, you said no inertial frames of nothing, any frame will be. Okay, and then, then you say matter curves space time. So, I put a particle there in a curve space time, and then um, how will it affect a particle or a beam of light? Because those are constrained to move along with the six of this. Right? So, so, for example, in the Newtonian theory, the Earth goes around the Sun because it is constantly attracted to the gravity and also it has got a velocity perpendicular to the radius wave. So, which makes it go in a circle. And so then uh, you can get ellipses and everything, as I'll show you soon. Uh, but then, uh, and the, the point is that it's this trajectory going like this. Whereas in general relativity, so you say it is not going in a circle like that, you're going around a spiral. But the spiral is in four dimensions, it's not in three dimensions. And so time will keep increasing. Okay, but then it's going along a circle. So it's a it's a different way of putting these things. And then there's the consequence also of general relativity, you already know those redshift and Precision of the perineum of mercury and bending of light. And so, when you, when you uh, construct the whole theory, like Einstein did in 1915, then you got a very elegant but extremely difficult set of equations. On the left, you have got, <coughs> you have got, this is a rich denser, this is scalar curvature, the more, most important thing is the vector. And on the right, you have got energy moment. So the idea is that the energy moment of the is curvature, and then there are the geodesic equations, and particles and photons move along the genes. And so everything can be worked out from this one. So then, uh, I will actually finish the theory in 1915. Uh, he, uh, he gave the approximate solution. And then he worked out the redshift and precision and so on. Uh, then in 1916, Schwarzschild gave uh, the first exact solution of Einstein theory, just a year afterwards. And some of you may know that he's, uh, he did this on the battlefield, because of the first world war. And Schwarzschild made extremely important contributions, because this is Schwarzschild's solution and then the theory of convection, all sorts of things. He has just talked, and he was quite young. And then he died, because he didn't survive the first world war. Then his son, who was at that time, maybe a couple of years old. So he became a very famous astrophysicist. And I actually seen him and talked to him. Okay. And so the Schwarzschild solution is this particular metric. And so, so you have got this spherical part, and then you have got the radial part, with this is 2 gm by c squared as you And then you see that the r is equal to 2m, this coefficient vanishes, and, r, and this coefficient becomes equal. Okay, but if you actually evaluate quantities like the Riemann tensor, okay, which are the physical quantities at that point, you say they are finite, there's no problem. So if you actually fall into a black hole, uh, you will not uh, you will not see anything happen. But you will be finished off in other ways because of the tidal forces, you will be stretched to infinite length. So you won't be living happily through that circumstance. Okay, but otherwise, I mean, if you manage to not do that, then you'll see nothing special happens to the side. If you look at the Pedro's coordinates, for example. And so if you compare this with the metric of special related to the black space type, okay, then you'll see that uh, <coughs> the difference. Because here, the Riemann tensor is non zero. Here, the longer is zero. So here, the space time coverage. Okay, so then uh, what happens? Uh, what is the effect of this kind of curvature? The best thing to do is to look at the light codes. So you'll agree with me that the R tends to infinity. Okay, so there uh, you get back this metric. And so if I go infinity from the black hole, so you get R is equal to zero. 
is a particle because Schwarzschild considered a such a particle with zero size. Okay, just like the beginning you will see. Uh, you, you so if that is sitting here, this is the R axis and this is the T axis. So if I draw the light cone at the infinite distance, it will be exactly like the light cone that I showed. But as you come closer, so how, you, how do you define the light cone? So it will be the trajectory, the light cone at any given point uh, will be the trajectories which correspond to the square is equal to zero. So these are the null zeros. And you see that um, here, uh, you see that there's some slight convergence. This is, of course, uh, this is the artist's impression. And as you come closer, you see that the light cone is bending. Okay, and then when you hit the Schwarzschild radius, you see that the entire future part of the light cone is pointing to the city. <coughs> and the past part is. So now, if you were, let's say that if you are somewhere here, Okay, then what would happen is that if you have fast, if you have small velocity, zero velocity, you will fall. Okay, and a trajectory is like this. And something like this, you can go off. You see that in detail. But when, once you come here, because your entire future is pointing towards R is equal to zero, okay, then everything will land up at R is equal to zero. So you see that the very nice intuitive way of understanding what is the problem with R with the, at the short end of this. And then, uh, then of course, the weird thing things happen when you go inside. One is that space and time are exchanged. Okay, because you see, why are they exchange? You see, when R becomes just time to end, okay, this will become negative and this will become positive. And so space and time get exchanged. You got that? And so then, now if I look at the picture of a black hole, Meaning that, that I got the particle sitting at R is equal to zero, and the equipotential surfaces are all spherically symmetric. Right? Because there is no asymmetry there. And then, then you have got this radius R equal to gm by c squared. And this is the event horizon. And what is the scale of that radius? The scale of that radius is 2 gm by c squared and normalized to 10 to the 8 solar mass, which is a supermassive black hole. And so what is R is? We did 3 into 10 to the 8 kilometers. So what would be the radius for a one solar mass black hole? You just have to look at it and say that it should take you one microsecond. And so 3 kilometers. And because you see that I have normalized this to 10 to the 8 solar mass. If I cancel this 10 to the 8, it normalized to one solar mass. And so, what will be the radius of one solar mass? Three kilometers. And so, this is what you should be doing. You can look at expressions like this. Why do I write them in that form? I write them in that form because it focuses your mind. So, if I tell you that the radius of a, a one solar mass object is three kilometers, then if I ask you what is the radius of a 17.1 solar mass object, then you start multiplying the value to all this. Normalize it to one solar mass. It three. 17 into 3 is 51. And so, so that is why you must put all astrophysical quantities in terms of units which are sensible for that particular situation. So if you are dealing with supermassive black holes, 10 to the 8 solar masses in the The stellar mass black hole, one solar mass in the And it's applied to everything. And so, so uh, why does this happen so turn around? You see an important slide. Slide of the day here. It's a very important slide. All right. <clears throat> so, um, you are, are you familiar with the 
concept of effective potential in Newtonian theory and in general relativity. Okay, Newtonian theory are on this thing. Great. So if I take uh, if I take a Newtonian thing, okay, and then a sun or whatever city at one point, and I consider the trajectories around it, there are three different kinds of trajectories. And one of these is a uh, uh, is that you've got a particle coming in from a great distance at a high velocity. So what will happen to the particle? It will come from a great distance there, and then it, it is at it will, uh, it will coming on the straight line. Okay, then as it comes closer, it's been uh, affected by the gravitational field, and it will come to a minimum distance and go off it. Okay, so it could be either going off it, yeah, it goes off it. If it comes with a sufficiently large velocity, if it comes with zero velocity, it will do the same thing. And it just come uh, from a great distance, come to a point and go back. The difference between these two trajectories is that the one with a <coughs> high velocity in the, in the, in the, at a great distance would be a hyperbola. When we start with a zero velocity, it would be a parabola. Now, both these uh, trajectories have a positive energy. Let's suppose that you have got negative energy, negative total energy. We'll understand that better. And then negative temperature, the water will be the shape of the thing, is just an ellipse. Okay, and then if you go to the bottom of the potential, that ellipse will become a circle. Right? And what is the general equation of the thing? That P by R is equal to 1 plus E cos phi. The E is the eccentricity, and what about P? Okay, that depends upon, that determines the rate of one of the eccentricity of the thing. Right? So, uh, so this you know. But supposing, how do I derive all this? So you could you could go into a, uh, you could actually put down Newton's laws and then the, the product of the trajectory and you could solve it. But what I want to do today is to understand it uh, quantitatively plus quality. You look at the you look at effective potential. So we have to, uh, so what is the mathematical framework for it? The Lagrangian dynamics. So I got I got a particle which is moving in a fixed gravitational field. So the first thing to do is to write down a Lagrange. And uh, the most convenient coordinates to use are R theta phi. Right? Then, uh, then you see also that um, the theorem which tells you that a particle like this, which has constant angular momentum, will be moving in a plane orbit. You know that, right? That's because the angular momentum is pointing in a direction and it is constant. So it must move in the plane. So that plane is taken to be theta is equal to pi by two. Right? So therefore, there are left only two coordinates, r and uh, r and phi. And then of course there is a time coordinate. So the Lagrangian is a kinetic energy, which is this one minus the potential energy. The potential energy is given by this. Right? So uh, now we know that there is a conserved quantity, uh, which is called the angular momentum. Okay, and then uh, that conserved quantity, angular momentum is m r squared by h. And then we know that there are other conserved quantity, which is called the energy, total energy. And that will be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And then you see the potential energy minus g m r. Uh, uh, so you will get a minus m, which is what we saw the different kinds of energy. If this were plus, then it will be very boring. Okay, so, uh, so now I can write down the total energy as r dot dr by dt square, okay, uh, minus gmm by r plus l square by 2 m r square. Right, so this is uh, algebra. And then I put um, the, and I take energy per unit mass, angular momentum per unit mass, and then I can write down the total energy there as half r dot squared plus v So you see that we are reducing to a one dimension in that way. Okay, and what will be effective in this particular potential? So what are the characteristics of this potential? Is that, first of all, uh, when I go, when r goes to infinity, this will go to zero. When r goes to zero, it necessarily goes to infinity. So you have infinity at one point and zero at another point. So you expect a minimum. And so there will be a minimum in this potential. 
And so now I draw the bridge. And so, so this is a, this is R, this is V effective. And you see that when I draw it, it looks exactly like my minimum results. And so now, what does this potential be? And how do I use it? And for that, I just look at these, uh, these two equations that we, we already have used. D5 by B squared L by R squared, dr by B squared is equal to T minus B squared. So if I start with a particle which is at a great distance and which is moving in, then you see that R and 5 will go to each other. What you could do is that you could choose 0 and the moment, L is equal to 0. In this case, what will be the trajectory? If angular moment is zero, see, if angular moment is zero, it has to intersect R is equal to zero. And so it just be a radial transit. So I, I leave a wall from a height and you start plunging down with the center of the earth. And center of the earth for me effectively because my ground is flat. Center of the earth is a normal to the surface of the earth. And so you just keep plunging. But if I have the slightest angular moment, then no matter how tiny it is, then it can't fall in straight. Right? So, so it, then it goes along a curve. So if I'm taking Halley's comet, so which is coming in from a great distance, then what will happen is that R will keep decreasing. You see that because I'm sitting, the sun is sitting here, it's coming along, and it will be a very, uh, it will be a highly elliptical orbit. It's not a parabolic orbit. If that is like that, the comet will come only once. With us, highest common is periodic. So it will come along the ellipse. It will come from there, uh, <coughs> go that way. But in the hyperbolic trajectory, it will come from there and go that way. And so, what does it mean that as I come in, R keeps decreasing? Right? But phi, phi will always keep increasing. Because the phi by d is always positive. I can take it to be negative. It means it will come this the Positive, it will go that way. So you get that phi and r are both changing. Now, how do I represent a particle orbit like that? Something is coming from infinity going to infinity on this effective potential. At effective potential, only r and t. There's no place so far. So I'm just fixing the energy, right? And then depending on the energy, this will be a straight line. The particle comes from infinity, hits this. And then it goes back. Why did it go back from this point? Okay, it goes back from this point because you see, if you're coming in from infinity and E is fixed here, V effective will keep uh, becoming more, more and more negative. At some point, why is it more negative? Because you're feeling the gravitational force. But then at some point, this will become zero. And when it becomes zero, there's a turning point. Does it mean the particle coming from infinity and going back? Won't do that. It is just that it is coming along the trajectory and going this It's only in the space of R that it is reflected by. But phi always keep decreasing, so it will go this So just please understand why am I telling you all this in such detail that once it gets in your mind, it will be able to work out through the whole thing yourself. But it becomes a lifelong asset. But so, so you see, uh, it will be like this. What about the trajectory which is sitting here? And where E is equal to zero, you start with E is equal to zero. And so then it will be just cutting this link here. It goes that way, cuts and goes that parabolic orbit. So what will be this kind of an orbit here? Pardon me? It's a little long. And so I've got a fixed angular momentum, and then I've got a fixed energy, and that energy is negative. Because when the energy is negative, See, what happens is that you get one zero in the other here and one zero in the other. And so therefore, it just keeps going back and forth, which is the orbit like this. And uh, if I take a fixed angular momentum, see, if I change angular momentum, this potential will change. Right? But if I take a fixed angular momentum, and then I've got a particle like this, which is going in the ellipse, tell me what will happen if I extract energy from that ellipse. So, uh, the thing which is going in elliptical orbit, how do I extract energy? I just put some gas in its path. And so then it will have this to slow down. Okay, I, I, I just block it over. So, 
So I'm extracting image. So tell me what will happen to the shape of the object. It won't immediately become shape. First, it will fall down. And so this one here will come down. And so which means that it's a highly elliptical object. It becomes less elliptical. Then I go on extracting energy. And what's the maximum energy I can extract from it? So it just comes. Then what happens? The orbit gets circularized. Okay, so the moon is going around the earth. The earth has water. Okay, so the moon produces tides on the earth. And thereby, see, they're going to fix angular momentum. And then thereby the energy keeps decreasing. So the orbit will become more and more circular. Which are more or less already happening. Okay, because the orbit of the Earth around the Sun and the orbit of the Moon around the Earth is almost circular. But then one more wonderful thing which happens is that the, both the Moon and the Earth have got finite size and they're both rotating. And you know that you're seeing only one face of the Moon. So when you go to the Moon, you'll always see the Earth up at a fixed point. It never sets or rises. And that is because uh, the Orbital period is locked. No, the spin period is the same as the orbit. Just think about it. And why did that happen again? Because of the loss of energy. And the perfectly, the least energy state for a binary is where the orbit is perfectly circular and the things are completely co co rotating. And that is the least energy. Good, so we have understood this one. And so these are the trends there. Now, now the point what I'm going to do now is to switch on general relativity, meaning that the same thing. I've got a particle sitting there, but now I want to do a general relativistic calculation. <laughs> right? And so for that I use Schwarzschild coordinates, I work out with JV6, and then I get my trajectories. Okay, so what will happen there? So you see that um, so this is the Newtonian part. In the Schwarzschild case, I can write it exactly like that, except that this one changes. Right? And then it becomes minus gm by r plus n square by 2 r square, which we had in the Newtonian thing, plus this extra term here, which is n square by r. Right? So now, when r tends to infinity, this will go to zero. Then, as r keeps decreasing, so you will hit a minimum. Then in like the Newtonian potential, you can start going down. But as, as R becomes smaller and smaller, this term will kick in. Okay, so then it becomes, then when R goes to zero, first, this will be the most important term, this is going to minus. So in the Newtonian case, you get a minimum and you go up there. So in this case, you're turning and coming back. Okay, but that is one change. The other change, of course, is things like R, etc. It's not quite the same as this. So, for example, what is the meaning of this R? Okay, then I'll have a, I'll have a sphere with constant R. It has got an area of four perhaps. That also applies here in the Schwarzschild case. You take a R is equal to constant sphere, you have an area of four perhaps. But otherwise, R becomes four perhaps. You cannot use it as a radial distance. Okay, because of the curvature of space. But keep that in mind. Okay, so here, um, you see that I unfortunately don't have the time to say what is E. I'm just saying that it's like energy. Okay, but it's uh, there are all sorts of things which happen. Okay, so to justify that. So let me look at the diagram now. And so this is the Newtonian potential. And this one here is the relative. So there are two main changes which occur. One is that <coughs> you see. When I have R is equal in the Newtonian case, this went to infinity. What it meant was that if I had the tiniest amount of angular momentum, okay, then uh, then the particle will always go. It cannot go because angular momentum is finite. And if it tries to go in, there'll be a breakdown of it. So it has to go. But in the general relativistic case, you see, because of the maximum here, so it's it, as I go on increasing the energy. Eventually, it will, it will go beyond this. So, which means that regardless of your angular momentum, you will always plunge into our space. It will be similar. Okay, so that is one big change. Other change is that 
In the Newtonian case, this particular trajectory was an ellipse. Okay, where, uh, whereas in the, I should have shown one more thing here. This is not an ellipse. In the general relativity case, if you look at it, it turns out that the ellipse is not closed. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, let's start with the closest point, which is the perigee. Okay, you go there and you come. By the time you come back, uh, you will not reach the perigee point. You, you, in order to reach the perigee, you have to go a little bit further. So it is as if the ellipse is rotating. Okay, so that is the essential thing which comes in because of the one upon r two position. Are you familiar with the book Classical Mechanics by Lanois Lucius? Okay, so so in that there is there are, there are two there. When you get an elliptical orbit, only when you've got a one upon r potential and a one upon r squared. So here you've got a one upon r cube. So you don't get uh, elliptical orbits. This is all incredibly beautiful. I mean, everything has to be done like that. And what Kanak does, Kanak Sartre, so that comes in this kind of a dynamics of research. Okay, so, uh, so you see that, um, okay. now, if you look at the relativistic orbits, you see here, like an orbit like this. Right? So, it, uh, so this kind of an orbit, that comes from infinity. And so here, <coughs> this kind of uh, is there, and this one, uh, no, this orbit that you see, okay, will be something like this. So the particle comes in, and then it spirals many times, and then it goes into the single line. And so here are, uh, now here's an orbit, uh, so, so here, so if you if I were a particle which is sitting right at this point, what would be the orbit? If I were a particle, if I were a particle sitting here, what is the shape of the orbit? It must be a circle, right? Because it is sitting at the midpoint of the orbit. So we can't go further. <coughs> the arc can either decrease or increase. So what would be the orbit? The circle. But this is a stable circle. In the sense that if I give the particle some energy, then instead of being at the bottom of the potential, we are almost at the But whereas if I put it at the top of the potential, it will sit there, it will keep going in a circle. But the slightest perturbation, so if you perturb it outside, it will go away. If you perturb it inside, then it will fall away. And so therefore, that orbit which you have is an unstable circle. Right? And then, uh, so now, an orbit like this, in the Newtonian case, would have been uh, an ellipse. In this case, it's a precise ellipse. You see that? So, yeah? Would the ellipse, the, does the orbit become closed at any point? No, it doesn't become closed. It will go on precise. It will go on like that. So, it will go on precise. You don't get a closed one. Okay, because by the time you come there, your tailings are you know, you never catch up. And so now, uh, now you see, you can easily calculate what is R minima and what's R max. Okay, so, the, so then you see that uh, uh, this is the R at this point, minimum, and the R maximum. Now, um, an extremely important thing in general. Uh, in the Newtonian case also, it applied to general relativity, it becomes more important because the phenomena that it leads to. Uh, just look at this. This is for a given L. Now, if I decrease L, then I get the second orbit. This is for L is equal to uh, 4.5. 4.5, so geometrized units. Something is equal to 1, something is equal to 1. But then 4.5. And right? so then, when I, when I decrease L, and then you see that it has become like this. And what you see is that the minimum has become deeper and the maximum also has come down. And so now uh, when I go on decreasing, so you see that at a particular thing, when L is equal to, see, suppose that I want R minimum is equal to R max. So what should happen? This should be zero. Right? 
And at what point does it happen? That L is equal to root 2 root 3 L. So this will be 0. So R minimum is equal to R. So you're going to think like this. And then um, both are equal and just false. In there. So if you have, uh, if, if I further decrease L, then you will not get, so you just get a thing that goes off without a minimum. So, um, so this has got an important consequence. Important consequence is the following. I mean, how do you get, how can you extract the result from this kind of system? Let's imagine that a particle is going in an elliptical orbit. And then I can, as I told you, I can put a gas in its path. I can do all kinds of things. And then, so that energy will come out. And the particle has got more negative energy. Then it goes on becoming a circle. And what is the maximum energy that can be extracted? The energy, first you start with the elliptical orbit. And the maximum energy that can be extracted is when it goes to the top. And so, uh, so now, now, why is this important? See, it is important because when you consider uh, an X-ray binary, you have got the accretion disk is it going down. And particles of the accretion disk are going in a state, in a circular orbit. And so, so, so they are, so you that they are going in a circular orbit. So there is potential, in general there is potential, because you have a black hole. And then, uh, going in a circular orbit. Now I can extract energy from because you see that X-ray binary is extracting energy from the gravitation. But as I go on extracting energy, I also extract angular moment. And therefore the orbits with the potential changes in space. And once the potential becomes like this, R minimum becomes the R maximum, I cannot extract any further energy. And it, it has no circular orbit. So the matter just plunges into the and so, so that is why uh, when, when you have got the X-ray binary patterns falling in, this is the maximum energy that you can extract. Okay, and then uh, what comes after is, yeah, R is equal to 3S. So here, uh, at this point, uh, when this becomes equal to this, it also R is equal to 3S. Okay, 3S is 6RG, where RG is equal to GM by 6 and so now, uh, now let us look at photon orbits. So we are looking for particle orbits. We need for photon orbits exactly the same. Because you have got the geodesic equation for photons. You can write that down, you can have an effective potential. But the effective potential here, uh, you see that it's got completely different shape, meaning that there is no minimum at all. Right? So because then you have a minimum and a maximum. So you could get these closed orbits. In the case of photons, you don't get closed objects, except when a photon is actually sitting. Okay, and uh, so what we that? You see with this closed object here. And here, R is equal to at 1.5 times the structure of the Right? So there is an orbit like this. When a photon comes and hits it and goes back, is this one. Coming from infinity, going to infinity. And when an orbit like this, okay? Then the photon comes with greater energy. So then uh, it comes from infinity and spirals in a cruise into the cloud. So what that? So um, now this object is unstable orbit. But have you have you read about the first image of a black hole? First image of an event horizon. So then you see that you see the black thing there. So that's not actually the black hole. It is just those tragic, those photons are being dragged in, you're not seeing them. And then the boundary which is there. And so that is this one. Okay, because you get you get a photon circle. Because the photons are trapped for some time. And so these are photons here at R is equal to 3 Rg and the similarity of the neutralize. But please remember that all this is only for a short child black hole. If I go to the next one, which is a rotating black hole. So Schwarzschild was in 1916, and the rotating black hole was Roy Kerr, so the Australian physicist, and that was in, uh, I think I have not put the date here. So between 1960 and 1963. Okay, so much more complex solution. 
So then you've got an event horizon. The event horizon looks very clear. It appears very clear simply because uh, it has got I mean, the projection is very clear. And uh, then you see, uh, just because now you have annual moment. So if the thing is spinning in a matter of speaking, and then you must get an ellipse point rather than a scale. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> and what kind of electrolyte do you think? The oblate ellipse. Because you see, if you're going to earth, suppose you earth a complete sphere, then you get the earth to rotate, then at the equator you'll have a higher centrifugal force, at the poles you'll have no centrifugal force, so it is as if it will be extended. Right? And then the axis of symmetry will be the minor axis. So you take an ellipse, rotate it around the minor axis, then you get to oblate ellipse. So you take a uh, you take an ellipse, rotate it along the major axis, and you'll get a <coughs> polar ellipse. So galaxies are generally believed to be polar ellipse. But then one more thing, so try to imagine it if you can. Uh, you see that in both these ellipsoids, there's axis of symmetry. In one case, it is the minor axis, other the major axis. But there can be ellipsoids which have no axis of symmetry. So the equation for that would be x squared by a squared plus y squared by b squared plus z squared plus c squared is equal to You just have to imagine what that kind of thing is. Okay, so, uh, so here these black holes have mass space. That's what I said charge. So if you, um, this is called a curved black hole if the charge is zero. When the charge is not zero, it is called a curved human, curved human solution. Okay, so the metric is far more complicated here. So all sorts of coordinate systems and what what boil link with coordinates. And uh, you've got the angular moment. Angular moment. Okay, so uh, and then the similarity at r is equal to zero. Uh, okay, at r is equal to zero. You see, this similarity, in the Schwarzschild case, the similarity is at r is equal to zero. So it's a point singular. And then the curvature and matter of are empty. But in this case, the singularity is as rho is equal to zero, and then you have got theta is equal to pi. Theta. So what about phi? Phi is unspecified. So for the singularity is not a point; it's actually a circle. Right? And then uh, there's a coordinate singularity just as in the Schwarzschild case. Coordinate singularity at delta is equal to zero. So you can just put it here. Okay, so these are known, that is known as the <coughs> event horizon. Okay, and for an extreme curved black hole, you've got A is equal to the mass. Because if, if A becomes less than the mass, then the solutions become unending. So which means that there's a, there's a maximum angular momentum that a spinning black hole can have. And in these geometrized units, A is equal to that. So, so here you've got the singularity. And then you've got the event horizon. And then you've got uh, something which is known as the ergosphere, and which is also known as the static limit. What happens is that, uh, see, just like when you enter an event horizon in the Schwarzschild case, nothing, you can't prevent the particle from going this, falling down to r is equal to zero. Similarly, uh, in a curved black hole, if you enter the ergosphere, then you are necessarily rotating. Okay, it's called frame black. You can work out the trajectories here that become far, far, far more complicated, these trajectories. And there are several people uh, who made uh, their name in Cambridge and in France that's working out these trajectories for the black hole. Uh, me, uh, agree, you're going to agree, yeah. Application this matter, yes. and false. Same is that you see, see, the mm -hmm. application this, what happens is that the matter will rotate. Mm -hmm. so if you have only one ring of matter, mm -hmm. it will keep rotating for L. But the fact is that you actually have got a piece. So any particular, you take one ring of matter, so what is happening is that it has got a viscous drag because of the outer ring. So as a result of this, it is any ring. Then it, it loses energy because of the viscous drag and also loses angular moment. And that is transferred to the As a result of which, there's a, there's a slow collapse of the battery. It's like slow seepage of the battery into the black hole. 
and then there's also corresponding extension to conserve angular momentum and energy. Yes, but here, here, here you are not even touching that question, the outside. You see, uh, the thing is that here you have got a ring which is going down, but there is no frame dragging. When you go into the atmosphere, then you don't need anything. You just can't stop in one place. Just like if I'm in a gravitational field, can I stop in one place? I can't. The only way is I can hover over the Earth, which have a force like in the other. Uh, for example, a helicopter does that. Right? It holds a different distance. How does it do it? Because of the rotating propellants. Or I can have a rocket. But um, if I have no force acting upward, then I will always fall. So similarly, in an atmosphere, I will always keep going. Okay. You can show that there are no solutions which correspond to GYD. So how much, uh, how much energy can you expect? Okay, so, uh, so here, uh, efficiency of energy extraction, you see, a by M is the angular moment, right? So what do you mean by efficiency of energy extraction? So adding a particle to a certain mass, it goes inside. As it goes inside, there's a negative energy. And I can say that that's, that's making the particle an effective mass of the particle. Because I'm extracting energy from it. Okay, so I got um, A by M here. What do you think was Schwarzschild called? Tell me where would be the Schwarzschild solution here? In the diagram, you must understand that clearly. What is A? A diagram is a spin. And uh, how much spin does a Schwarzschild black hole have? Zero. zero. So if I want to, where is the Schwarzschild black hole? Then I just have to put A is equal to zero. And where is the Schwarzschild black hole? Here it comes to Okay, and what is the efficiency of energy extraction? Um, it is, it is a, some 0.57%. Okay, where does that come from? Because you see, I got that potential, right? So uh, I go on extracting energy and I know moment. If I just extract only energy, then you go to the bottom. But I extract energy and also extract angular moment. So potential, which looks like this, gradually becomes this. After that, there are no stable moments. It's just plunge inside. And so, and when that happens, I have extracted 0.57%. Okay, whereas, um, now in the Schwarzschild case, counter-rotating and co-rotating. What do I mean by that? The spin is in one direction, my orbit is in the same direction. Or spin is in one direction, my orbit is in the other direction. But here, uh, there is no spin, so that both are the same. And you see, you've got a co-rotating orbit, then as A by N goes to 1, you see that I can extract about 40% of the energy. And so if I, you see, why am I talking about energy extraction? Because both in extra bionics and as well as in AGN, for example. You are, how do you power it? The AGN has got the jets which are going up. How do you power the energy? And that energy, it cannot come from inside the black hole. Okay, it comes from, uh, it, 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 it comes from the energy extracted from outside the black hole. Okay, and how does the energy extracted by pouring matter? Professor Nadish will be talking to you if they're not. I think it goes to the So, um, so there's a thing called the Penrose process for the extraction. So, Professor Nadish and his students working in Pune in pre Ayuka times. So, they had a, they had a new kind of Penrose process, magnetic Penrose process. So, they could extract even more. And you can ask him about it. Okay, so. <clears throat> This is point nine. Okay, all right. Um, so the, this one I've already done for you. This is the cave of white box. So we just run through this. This one also I've showed you. Yeah. Okay, so I'll start from here the next time. Any other question? You don't need the name. Uh, just put Hartley in Amazon or Google Library. It's something, it's just a general relativity or whatever. Okay? So just go to the library and put Hartley into the computer and you'll get it immediately. Or go to Amazon and uh, any of the booksellers and put Hartley in. 
You can see it's a, it's a very, very nice book. And how do we know a black hole is rotating? How do you write the rotation? Uh, how do I, if you show me a black, that's a very good question. So, um, how do I know? See, what will happen is that there is no direct way of knowing about it. Um, if the black hole, you see, like you are looking at the thing in certain. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll tell you the, the best way of doing it. So you, you get it from gravitational waves. Okay, so when you have, uh, when you have the two black holes which plunge into each other, and then you get the waveform which comes out, that depends upon the space in the two black holes. Okay, so, so you can't put limits on the black hole spin We are the most valuable. So, so like, uh, Schultz child, black hole is not rotating and the other one is rotating. The third black, black hole is rotating. How did it classify like? Uh, we have measured waves from every. All right. Okay, then I'll give you another way of uh, deciding where it's a question. First, first of all, it's an extremely good question. It's the kind of question that you should be asking. But someday, you also have to know how to get the answer yourself. And so that is a transition from being a student to being a researcher. So, one very nice way of uh, doing it is the following for various atomic physics reasons. Many of these uh, AGN, etc., when you look at the spectrum, they have got a line with iron. So you say, why iron? Why not zinc? Why not, why not tin? It's all because of the uh, atomic process. And the iron line dominates. And it has got an energy of about 7 8. Okay, now this line is so strong. Uh, now, when you, when you actually look at the spectrum, the line is always broad. Right? The line is broad because of maybe the gas is moving. Problems, it's all kinds of things. Now, uh, as the light is emitted when the matter is falling under the black hole, because there is an accretion basically. So, so what happens is that uh, there are three effects is that one is special electricity Doppler effect. There's a Doppler effect because the photon comes in from itself, the transfer is Doppler effect. And then there's a gravitational redshift. So when you get a photon, which, uh, the iron line photon. And going from deep inside the black hole, there's a gravitational redshift which can take place. Right? Uh, so, so, what will happen to the line? You tell me. Uh, the line is this way. There's some natural broadening. Now, if it comes from deep in, the greater the gravitational redshift, the, the more negative, the lesser will become the energy of the line. So, what will happen to a line which is this way? So, you're going to lie this way, and this is the energy axis. Okay, so this way, and then because of the loss of energy, you start getting a tail. And because why do you, why do you get a tail? Because there are lower and lower energy photons, which are coming from deep inside the gravitational potential. Now, how deep can you go? Because you see that you've got the agency of the accretion disk, and these are all coming from the accretion disk. The accretion disk requires nearly stable orbits. So they will require a potential which has got a deep. And so we have seen that as you decrease the angular momentum, then the minimum will disappear. So that is the closest distance that you can approach. And I told you that that distance is at a certain point in the short side zone. Okay, whereas uh, if it uh, if, if it's a curved geometry, you can go deeper. Right, so so that happens at uh, I forgot the number for it. I'll tell you a bit. So so what happens in a curved geometry? You go deeper. Right, so therefore in a curved geometry, uh, the line has kind of okay. So then it is much more, thin. and this is considered to be one of the great triumphs of this thing. I, I, what do we have it here? In computer. Ah, there. 
Is he, is he the iron guy? And uh, this is the mechanism for everything. And you see that these are the things. Well, what affects the line profile? Special relativity, general relativity, and the line profile becomes like this. And uh, so you see that in a Schwarzschild geometry, this is what you get. In a curved geometry, this is what you get. And this is the data. And it happened over many years. If not, I think they suddenly measured this data. It went on for 20 years. And you see the data, is that you get this fit here, and that fit corresponds to a rotating black hole. It's very important, it's not a straightforward thing. I'll come to this again next time, forget the time. Sir? Uh, sir, like we know that a uh, black hole has great uh, gravitational power. Like sun has also a great gravitational power. So if uh, sun passes through a black hole, so would it disappear or? Uh, See, what will happen is the following. Uh, so this is a, again a very good question. So uh, what you're asking is the following, that there's a black hole there and a star is coming. So at the star coming to the state, there are tidal forces. What do you mean by tidal force? Why, why do you get tides on the surface of the Earth? So then it's because, first of all, there's the moon and the sun. You can forget the sun for a moment. Then the moon has got a certain force on this side of the Earth. It has got a certain force on the other side of the Earth. Right? And, there's a, and that force is different. Because of that, if you imagine that the ocean is a sphere, the ocean will become elliptical. Then what about more on this side of the Earth? It just actually becomes elliptical. You can look at these tides. So now the sun is also made up of gas. As it comes towards the black hole, it will start getting more and more distorted, more and more distorted. And then as it comes towards the event horizon, it will be torn up. Okay, because the, the, the force of the, the sun's the black hole gravitational field is so much higher than the sun's gravity. It gets torn up. Okay, and then it, the gas will collapse into the black. But what is possible? Is that if you adjust the parameters properly, uh, the, the, it, the sun will not get torn apart until it reaches the event horizon. Okay, and then the whole thing is swamped. Because you've got sun at one moment, other moment you've got into the back. And there will be no energy. Okay, whereas if it gets torn apart, then all that energy is. And in fact, there's a very beautiful paper written many years ago by Martin Peeps. And uh, so there it says that. Uh, he discusses this, so the tidal disruption of the star. And uh, if you actually look at the nuclei of galaxies, it's possible for you to look at this, to actually study this tidal disruption. Okay, so they get torn apart, energy limited, you can see a flash. So this is all uh, very complex as to this. Okay, so the more you study, the more you 